The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are my own or those of my guests, and in no way represent the views of the company or companies that I or we work for. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they are told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. You're listening to Squawk Ident an aviation podcast dedicated to the journey and the challenges surrounding the life and career of Aviator Tony, an airline pilot currently flying for a legacy airline with close to 20 years on the flight line. This is episode 17 of Squawk Ident, recorded on the 6th of January, 2020, from the Aviator Sound Studios somewhere in Southern California. On this episode of Squawk Ident, we will explore why right now is the time to make the move into aviation if you are thinking about becoming a professional pilot. We will discuss the avenues available to train to being a pilot in today's market. We will also discuss rare finds and the film The Aeronauts, now out on Amazon Prime. All this and more on this episode of Squawk Ident. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show right after a brief word from our sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. First show of 2020, a decade has begun, and I must say it has energized my spirit to the possibilities to what's ahead of me. I hope you all feel the same way as well. As I have mentioned before, I'm not one for New Year's resolutions. Inevitably, resolutions fail, or they just get forgotten. The ability to change, I believe, is uh, something that should always be a constant as is personal growth. So for those of you out there who have been contemplating a new challenge with your journey, now is the time. More on that in a bit. But first, let's recap episode 16. Well, the uh, interview in San Juan, Puerto Rico with Captain Hans was an absolute blast. I want to, again, thank you, uh, Captain Hans, for sitting down with me and uh, having a chat while we were on that layover. It was one of my favorite layovers of 2019. And I've got to say, if any of you have a chance to either fly out or take a vacation, check out San Juan. Great destination, great food, and the people were very friendly. And I'd like to hear about what you think of that interview and some of the other shows as well. I'm looking forward to some feedback. You can do that either via any of the social media links for Squawk Ident and Aviator Tony. You can do that directly from the website at aviatortony.com or uh, whatever platform you're listening to, most of them have a way to leave a message or audio feedback. Audio feedback would be a great way to get on the show yourself. Just, you know, tell us what you think, what you'd like to hear, and I'd love to play it back and have a discussion on maybe the next show. So you can also uh, listen to the show via Anchor, via the Anchor app, or uh, if you're on a tablet or a PC, you can check out anchor.fm to get started with that. And I recently uh, submitted the Squawk Ident show to an app called Stitcher. Uh, those of you that have heard of Stitcher, maybe you have it on your phone or you listen to another podcast, uh, as soon as they uh, give me the thumbs up, it'll also be available on the Stitcher app. So that's exciting. But let's continue with uh, what we're talking about here. Speaking of new challenges and getting into the aviation industry at the right time. The reason I kind of started going down the road of this topic is because I've mentioned it before in some previous episodes, and I was recently clearing out some old magazines. Uh, You know, we all have piles and piles of magazines laying around our place. And, you know, I do my best to kind of look through them, 
make sure that there wasn't anything in there that I missed. And the ones that are good and I want to keep, I keep. But uh, I've really done my best to kind of weed out all the unnecessary things. So that's what 2020 is all about. And especially here at the beginning of 2020, we you know, have made a kind of commitment to kind of clearing out in my household. So I started out with a stack of magazines and most of them are either running magazines or uh, flying magazines, primarily AOPA pilot. Now, AOPA, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, once you get started in aviation and you decide to go and get your student pilot certificate, uh, most of the time your flight instructor will reference you to check out um, a membership with AOPA, which is Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Uh, I don't know if you need to have a certificate number to join. I think anyone can join. You can check out their website. I believe it's uh, aopa.org. Uh, or you can uh, just grab a magazine from the shelf, and I'm sure there's uh, ways to to subscribe to the, either the website or the newsletter, the magazine. There's a couple magazines that come with your membership. So you pay an annual membership fee, uh, and that grants you access to training uh, portals on their website. Uh, it gets you access to flight seminars. So in your local area, they might have a flight seminar once in a while. And it's a membership card that you can proudly you know, take along with you. And most every pilot that I know, at least you know, when they're starting out, has an AOPA membership. Uh, and once you get into the airline world, some people would say, well, you know, I, I'm not in GA anymore and they let it go. I've maintained my membership uh, now for 20 plus years. Uh, I proudly have it. And part of that is they'll send you a magazine every month. And there are different versions of the magazine. I personally subscribe to the Turbine Edition, uh, simply because it just makes sense. I get to see some cool GA uh, jet aircraft out there. And so I'm going through the stack of magazines, and I saw on a July of 2018 issue that I was thumbing through. Now, mind you, this is uh, you know a year and a half ago, but uh, I saw an article that was very well written and. I think a little bit ahead of its time. And I wanted to share that with you a little bit today. So the title of the article is uh, Snapped Up. Airlines look to grab pilots from anywhere they can. And this article was written by Ian J. Tombley. I hope I'm saying that correctly, or Tubley. Uh, great illustrations also with this article, um, illustrated by Peter Horvath. A little shout out to Peter. Uh, great job on these illustrations. So thumbing through this article, I'm not going to read the whole thing uh, verbatim to you, but uh, quite an interesting analysis of what we're feeling already in terms of hiring. So the article again, uh, naysayers immediately disregard talk of massive hiring waves and pilot shortages, but the data is undeniable. Airline hiring is occurring at a pace many experts say have never happened in their lifetimes, and its impacts are being felt throughout the world of aviation. Boeing estimates that more than 600,000 new professional pilots will be needed worldwide over the next 20 years, including 117,000 in North America. Lewis Smith, president of Career and Financial Advisory Service, Future and Active Pilot Advisors, man, that's a mouthful, <laughs> says that 29,000 pilots at the 11 major U.S. airlines will reach age 65 in the next 10 years, indicating that major airlines will need nearly 3,000 pilots a year, even if the industry doesn't grow, and not accounting for natural attrition. Of course, the industry is expected to grow, and there is attrition, so the actual number required will be much higher. Add in the regional airlines, corporate flight departments, fractionals, and charter operators, and it's clear that the help-wanted side will be hanging for years to come. But with fewer than 6,000 new airline transport pilot certificates on average each year, there's clearly a supply problem. Who will fill the cockpits? You know, this article by Ian... Uh, Tombly is very interesting because it does chronicle uh, 
three individuals that they focus on. Uh, one is a housewife that decided, you know what, I've always wanted to fly um, and decided I'm going to go and go to ATP uh, flight school. And, you know, kids were grown teenagers in high school and in junior high. I, I can do it. So at the age of 39, she just kind of jumped in there feet first, went to a flight school, got all her ratings and got employment uh, with uh, one of the Delta Connection Airlines. She's uh, quoted in the article as saying, you know, as a mom and a female, I have a lot of guilt about not being around my kids, she said. But I also am showing them some great life lessons of what it's like to go after your dreams. And I absolutely agree with this statement. Uh, the article goes on and, and chronicles a couple other individuals that went on to change a job, change career, and just dive into this industry because they see that there is a huge demand. Um, you know, I couldn't agree more. I, I've seen it as a, a flight instructor back in the day, uh, as a uh, Czech airman from a regional airline. I was dealing, working hand in hand with the training department and with recruitment. And I can tell you that, you know, I, I was there on the very, very onset of this hiring boom. And, you know, now I'm no longer involved in that, but I can see it that, you know, there is still a big demand for pilots in the future. And in the next 10 years, I think it's just going to explode. So if you're at home uh, or, you know, you're at a job that you're happy with, but maybe are not, you know, it's not what you want to do. It's not your dream. And if you have the means uh, to do it, by all means, I mean, start the decade right and dive into it. Uh, go out there and and find a, a flight school or a program and get your feet wet. You know, I, I always encourage people to get their feet wet and, you know, take a couple lessons, try it out. You're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. You know, it's simple as that. So, you know, this article goes on. I'm not going to read the whole thing, like I said, but there are some... <laughs> compelling stats in here 50.6 50. uh average age of an atp certified pilot uh up from 46.6 .6 in 2002 58,549 dollars first year average pay for raa member airlines uh, don't even ask about second year pay because it does go up with that 117,000 that's how many pilots will be required in North America over the next 20 years, according to Boeing. And Boeing does these amazing stats. If you go to their website, they do have, you know, a lot of industry information, industry averages, and and the demands of pilots. They're really pushing uh, for an aviation uh, education. Uh, Boeing is a great partner in trying to get the pilots out there. 38,401. That's the number of new student pilot certificates issued in 2017, down from 63,468 pilot certificates issued in 2008. So nearly half of the number of stu new student pilot certificates being issued in, in under 10 years. So this is alarming. Um, good in a way for those of us that are in the industry, because as the demand for the profession goes up, that means contracts and uh, labor agreements, labor contracts usually improve because the demand goes up. So it's both good and bad. Uh, and of course, that in the end will always translate to a good move for someone who's thinking about getting into the industry. And just to finish off, a few more words from this article from Ian Tolbley, uh, an AOPA pilot magazine, that uh, airline members of the Regional Airline Association, the RAA, are most at risk. Uh, let's see here. By their estimate, nearly three quarters of their aircraft could be without crews within the next eight years if the population of professional pilots doesn't grow. The group's president, Faye Markley Black, thinks her members have been on the leading edge of partnerships with universities to provide a clear path to the cockpit, but that challenge is simply too big for the airlines to solve. 
by themselves. Uh, these market-based solutions are compelling and help to spark interest, but cannot alone resolve what the is fundamentally an underlying policy problem where the career path is unaccessible for most Americans. With tuition and hours building requirements reaching $200,000, most Americans cannot access the lucrative career, she said. Black said proposals offering a more direct investment in training combined with a restricted ATP that focuses on quality of experience. They have met with political resistance and claims of unsafe practices. How long the boom times for pilots will continue is at this point still a guess. Airlines have for decades had a cyclical ebb and flow of hiring, and many argue that this time is no different. Black said she doesn't see an end to the shortage, in part because we'll need thousands of new pilots every year for the foreseeable future, just to tread water. And uh, even Smith, who has a pilot's skeptical eye on the market, agrees that things look good for someone coming into the profession today. An economic recession would certainly reduce the hiring, but it would be difficult for the airlines to furlough off the bottom with so many leaving at the top of the seniority list, he said. If they can entice a stay-at-home mom to jump into the new career and a happy corporate pilot to leave a lavish life and a successful flight school owner to step out, it's clear the airlines have retaken their place in the principle of professional flying. Now, these... Uh, you know, the, the corporate pilot and the uh, flight school owner were the other two characters that they, they were uh, talking about in the article that I, that I kind of skipped over. I didn't want to read the whole thing to you. But yeah, I mean, it, pretty amazing. Uh, the demand of pilots that are on the horizon. If you're not a pilot and not interested in aviation career and you're just listening to this podcast because, you know, you're interested in supporting the show and, and interested in what I have to say, first off, thank you. Um, but that could still affect you because if you're traveling somewhere in a few years, it could be that your flight might get delayed or canceled because they can't find pilots to fly them. And that, that's going to make headlines. Uh, it's happened before. It doesn't really happen at mainline. But, you know, if these things continue, the numbers don't lie. This may be an issue for the future. So, again, if you're thinking about training to be a pilot or maybe you were and you stopped for whatever reason and you think, I don't know, is it worth it for me to get back into it? You know, hands down, you know, I agree. Yes, it is. And there are many ways to do that. Uh, one way is, you know, of course, depending on where your back, what your background is, where you're coming from, uh, what your finances are, you know, as the article mentioned, it is very expensive to get all the ratings that you need. Now, there are many airlines out there today that have started what they're calling a cadet program. And from my understanding, a cadet program is a program you have to apply to get into. And I know, I know there are carriers out there like Delta United and American that are all starting these kind of cadet programs. I heard JetBlue has started one. Uh, so, you know, do some research, uh, look it up on the internet. And uh, if you're interested in kind of finding out more about it, you know, the best way to go about it is go directly to the horse's mouth, look up the websites, and you can apply most of the time online. And the way those programs work are you're in your flight school, you're training, and they're going to help you either financially with your training uh, and going if you go through the approved program at the approved flight school, then when you come out, you're guaranteed a position or an interview position uh, with that carrier. And if you get hired, they'll even reimburse a lot of your tuition expenses. Uh, I understand that... Uh, I believe American Eagle or Envoy PSA Piedmont, uh, they have a similar program to that where uh, if you go to an accredited uh, school that's on their list of uh, cadet schools, you can go through the program and then apply for and get a restricted ATP 
certificate. Now, you need an airline transport pilot certificate uh, in order to work at a 121 carrier or an airline. So in order to get that, you traditionally need 1,500 1, hours of flight time uh, prior to getting that rating. Because of the high demand, there are a few what they call restricted ATPs. And one of them is if you go to an accredited university, get a, you know, all your flight ratings commensurate with one of these programs, and you do so while getting a BS in aviation sciences. Uh, so you're, you're kind of getting your college degree in an aviation practice while doing your flight training. When you graduate, uh, these places will hire you. So uh, they'll help you with the tuition costs. They'll help you pay to get hours. And then instead of the 1,500 hours, you can get hired with much less. I don't know the exact number. It's been a while since I looked at that, but I believe it's 1,000 hours. So that could save you quite a bit of time in flight training and expense of uh, you know being out there being a flight instructor or doing whatever you're doing to build hours because most people can get all their ratings in under 400 hours of fl total flight time. So how do you get from 400 hours to 1,000 or 1,500 hours is you get a job as a flight instructor and you get to log that time. And that's the more common way. Of course, the airlines are also hiring people that have previous experience. They're also hiring uh, military background pilots, uh, you know, because as they're aviators. So they know they can do the job. They know they can pass their, their rigorous training. So it's usually a fair bet. But as the demand for pilots increases, you know, that pool is going to be shrinking as well because there's less uh, pilots coming out of the military. There's a lot more drone pilots. There's a lot more helicopter pilots. So, you know, it's it kind of doesn't translate to filling the seats that are in demand or going to be in demand in, in the next less than 10 years. So uh, my advice that I usually give to people is if you're, you know, young individual, always been interested in aviation, go out and find a part 61 school that uh, lets you pay as you go and maybe do like a Cessna program or, or the King school program and do all your ground school online and get your flight training in, pay it flight by flight and get your private pilot license. I believe it used to be 40 hours was the minimum that you had to have. I don't know if they've upped that or not. I heard the national average is more like 80 hours. So realistically, when you do the calculations on what it's going to cost, you need to figure you know, you're going to require 80 hours of flight instruction plus the expense of the ground school and the and the books and the text and the charts and whatever else you're going to need, a headset or whatever equipment you might want. So, you know, if you add all that up and that's in your budget, great. If you get your private pilot license and you enjoy the flying and you've done the homework on what it means to, you know, follow this profession and this career, this passion, and you're willing to get into it, then, then start looking at like big flight schools, major programs, cadet programs, because you've gotten your feet wet, you know what to expect, you know if it's for you or not, at least at that point you have a good idea. So I think that's the most economic way. Uh, there are plenty of schools out there. Uh, I personally like the ATP school. Uh, I've never attended the ATP school, but uh, they're nationwide and they're kind of like on a fast track program. They're going to get you just the ratings that you need. Um, and, you know, if you move in the middle of your training, you there's usually an ATP school somewhere close by. So you can just transfer over and, you know, you're going to have to like redo lessons so the, so the instructor can kind of judge where you're at kind of thing. You can just kind of pick up where you left off. And I, I highly appreciate that uh, philosophy of doing things. So yeah, there are plenty of flight schools out there that, you know, need the business as well. Uh, do your homework, do the research, uh, check out the reviews uh, online before you commit. And, you know, there's plenty of opportunity out there. So enough about flight schools and uh, and the, the future of the pilot shortage in the airline industry. Let's move on to From the Flight Line.
Well, uh, from the flight line, a segment I haven't had a chance to really dive into over the past few episodes because of all the interviews, uh, but a little bit about what my last week was. Uh, pretty much good schedule, only had three days, I think, off. They were split up. So as you heard in the last episode, came back from Puerto Rico via Dallas, Fort Worth with a deadhead that landed at LAX. And then we had, uh, I was riding in the, as a deadheader. So in the back of the airplane, getting a ride to get back to my home base. And, you know, the flights were full from the holiday travel. And, you know, it, so I, I, I stuck with the deadhead that I was originally scheduled on. And it was a 787, got to sit in the back, relatively smooth flight, no hiccups. We got into LAX. I think I did mention this in the previous episode. When we landed, they didn't have a gate for us. They were going to put us on what's called a hard stand, which is a remote terminal area that they can park a large aircraft. And, you know, there's a a jet bridge that'll take you uh, down to the ramp level where you'll hop on a bus and the bus will drive you into the terminal. Well, as a passenger, not a big deal. The passengers go on the bus, they uh, get into the terminal, they either go to baggage claim or to a connecting flight. They don't have to deal with, you know, security or anything like that. Well, as an employee, just trying to get to the employee lot, it's kind of a pain because the employee lot is right there, but there are no vehicles that can take you there. And for whatever reasons, either whether it's security or policy or, or just staffing issues, they don't allow employees to do that. They have no way of doing that. So you have to ride on the bus, go back into the terminal, and then go to the employee area where the employee bus is and then get on another bus and go right back to where basically where you were to get to the employee lot so that you can get to your car and go home and that it's just kind of frustrating because you know that process take takes a bit of time and that's time away from you being on the way home so but that is how my trip ended now i had monday and tuesday off which were great and then wednesday afternoon after you know, repacking my bags, headed to the airport, did a late night flight into Honolulu. Uh, flight was pretty good. Uh, cool captain, flown with them before. And uh, we got into Honolulu, pretty decent hour. Uh, I think it was 9.30 at night. Uh, just enough time to get to the hotel, get cleaned up. Uh, a little too late to go out anywhere, and it was a pretty long day, so um, I just I hit the rack, as they say, and got my rest. The next morning, went for a wonderful run over Waikiki Beach, um, went around the zoo area, if uh, any of you are familiar, and uh, just got some sunshine, and, and it was a beautiful day. Uh, not too hot, not too humid, a good breeze, and you know, what more can you ask for, right? Uh, got cleaned up, went to a place that I like to go to when I'm in Waikiki, uh, but the line to get in there was around the corner. I just couldn't stomach waiting an hour just to be seated to go to my favorite local restaurant. So ended up finding another place that I really did enjoy. I ended up at Blue Ocean Seafood and Steak. It's a, a tiny little place on uh, the Kale Road in Honolulu on uh, basically a Waikiki. And, you know, outdoor seating. I had the the mahi, the grilled mahi with a, a mango uh, topping there. It was absolutely wonderful. Sat out there on the patio, and wouldn't you know it, as the food was <laughs> presented, it just started to rain. Uh, luckily, it didn't get too wet because... They had some nice umbrellas out there, but here I am sitting in the this kind of uh, pedestrian alley and just listening to the rainfall, eating just amazing food, and just not taking for granted the fact that here I am on a layover in paradise and just really enjoying my time uh, there on the island. On the way back, of course, I always stop 
at my favorite ice cream shop right around the corner, Lappert's Ice Cream. If you haven't had Lappert's Ice Cream, I've been having Lappert's occasionally since I was probably about four or five years old. My parents used to stop at this little ice cream shop actually in Sausalito, California, uh, right across the bay there, uh, north side of the bay uh, in Marin County. And right downtown Sausalito, there's a a little ice cream shop with Hawaiian ice cream. And we used to, you know, for a treat every once in a while, we drive the the family over there and go get some of this Lappert's ice cream. So when I'm in Hawaii, and especially Honolulu, I always stop in and get at least a scoop of the Kona coffee ice cream or the <laughs> the the Kona lava java, uh, which was the, what I had last time there uh, the other day. And it was amazing. I highly recommend it. If you're out and about and you ever come across a Lapras ice cream shop, stop the car, get out, go check it out. It is definitely worth it. And the nice thing about this trip was it was not a red eye to come back into LA, which is kind of rare for me. I usually can only hold island flying if it includes a red eye of some kind to get back into LA, which is kind of tough because you got to lay down and take a nap for a little, uh, a bit before you, you you know, you venture out to do that. And on this particular trip, it was just a two day trip, one leg out to Honolulu, one leg back. And the flight left at, uh, at three 50 and landed in Los Angeles at 11 o'clock PM. It was perfect. It was just like a, a regular day. And, you know, by the time I got to my car and drove home, I, you know, I got home a little bit past midnight, but, you know, way different than shooting a red eye. I wasn't, you know, really tired. And, and usually when I do a red eye and I get home after one of those, I'm pretty much spent for half the day the next day. I mean, I'm just I'm tired. I try to sleep in, but of course that usually doesn't happen. I'm not the type to to kind of sleep in, uh, my body clock just says, Oh no, it's time to get up. Even, even if I only had a few hours of sleep, that's just the way it works for me. So, you know, not having to deal with that is, was actually quite nice. Uh, got to spend all day Friday at home, uh, had some family time there, a lot of chores around the house, get it cleaned up. All the Christmas and new year's, uh, evidence has been stowed away properly for, uh, the storage for the year uh, until next year. And I, you know, this year it just didn't feel like a uh, Christmas drug out. I think we, we got on the cleanup pretty quick and it was, it was nice. Uh, Saturday head, head back to the airport and did a one leg out to Lahui and one leg back. I uh, had a really good crew. Uh, got to hang out a little bit uh, in Lahui after our arrival. And, uh, it was a good trip. Next day, slept in and got to actually uh, get out there. I didn't really feel like running uh, since I, I did a, a pretty good run in Honolulu a couple of days earlier. So I took advantage of the situation. It was kind of a windy day and a little bit overcast. It was raining off and on. So after a, a quick bite to eat, back to the hotel room and I sat there and and got on my tablet and watched a movie, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the show. So that was my my week this week. Uh, Sounds relatively uneventful because it was relatively uneventful, which any aviator will tell you, boring is good. So that's my trip this week. Next week, some exciting new flying for me that I have never done before. So I've got a four-day trip starting next Friday. That's going to take me to Orlando and then uh, aircraft swap and then head over to LaGuardia for an overnight. After a relatively short overnight in LaGuardia, we'll head to Miami the next day. We'll swap airplanes and then we're going to Quito, Ecuador, uh, an airport that I believe is about 9,000 feet elevation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'll be doing a little bit of homework before I head to the airport for that trip. But uh, because it is a high terrain airport, um, I will actually be flying out there with a Czech airman. And the reason for that is my Latin terrain qualification or division expired on the 1st of January. So every year 
uh, first officers have to get requalified. Either that is done through the ground school uh, portion of uh, international training, or it can be done on a line with a Czech airman. And that's what uh, I'm going to be experiencing. So uh, head down there with a Czech airman. He's going to evaluate, give me some pointers, make sure I'm doing everything correctly, the standard operating procedures. Uh, you know, we're going to be talking about all kinds of things like drift down procedures, single engine drift down procedures, um, alternate uh, drift down routing. Uh, and it's it's pretty involved. Uh, the, the, it's not just a regular flight down there uh, because it's you know, South America has a lot of jungle, a lot of terrain, and it's a high elevation airport. So there are policies and procedures in effect with that as well. So it, that's an exciting trip coming up. Uh, on the return, after I believe it's a 30-hour overnight in Quito, then I'll be flying back to Miami where I'll have pretty much most of the day uh, there to get some rest. I think it's like 11-hour uh, rest or 11 hour layover. And then I'll fly a late night flight from Miami back to LA on day four. So that trip, I'm going to do it, uh, next weekend. And then I believe I do it again, uh, the following weekend, same trip. So really cool experience, a little excited about it. Um, it can be kind of tricky from what uh, I've heard from some of the other aviators I've talked to about it. So a little bit of homework to be done. Uh, better, as I say, to be overprepared and underwhelmed than the other way around. So uh, some exciting flying coming up. And I can't wait to tell you all about it. So uh, as I mentioned uh, over the holidays on one of the episodes... Uh, we took a little family trip over to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And on one of the days, we were able to uh, borrow my father-in-law's car and get out there and drive around Albuquerque. We lived there for about four years uh, at the turn of, uh, oh, wow, about uh, exactly 20 years ago. We were there 99, uh, 2000, the, the whole you know, millennium bug that was going on and all the fear mongering <laughs> with the uh, technology is going to turn against you kind of thing that was going on. We were in Albuquerque at the time. And uh, so we were there until 2004. And we got to drive around and see the changes, see the old house and uh, visit some friends. And it was it was a great experience. Well, one of the days we had a little bit of extra time and uh, we're driving uh, right down Central Avenue there and checking out the uh, University of New Mexico, UNM. And across the street from the university was a little pawn shop. And I thought, well, you know, here I am, kind of new to the podcast scene and, uh, you know, really getting into it. Maybe I can go check out the pawn shop and see if, you know, at minimum they have like a microphone or something I could check out, maybe get some new sound or something just for fun. So popped in there and I was very surprised that most of what they had uh, was the typical stuff you would think you'd get at a pawn shop, musical instruments and, you know, power tools, some bicycles, a lot of DJ equipment, a lot of big speakers. And they also had a case full of microphones, mixers, all kinds of things. And I was able to talk to the guy for a little bit and turned out that he had a, a box full of microphones, the USB microphones. You know, they were asking a, a, a fair price for used equipment. But he also had a box of XLR microphones. And he's like, man, I've been sitting here for a while. You know, how about 10 bucks a pop? And I'm like, well, oh, that's a pretty good price. You know, can you guarantee they work? He's like, oh, yeah, everything works. I just uh, don't really have any cables to, to plug it in. I said, well, it's kind of risky to to spend some money on microphones, but I started looking at them and I thought, well, yeah, they're used, but you know, you could always use a good uh, dynamic microphone and that's what they were, three dynamic microphones. And I look over and he has a couple Behringer mixers back behind him. And I'm like, well, what are those things? Are those mixers? And I'm playing dumb. And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, they're sound mixers. Uh, yeah, so if I get the microphones, I'll have to go buy some cables and I guess I can plug it into a mixer before I plug it into a speaker that that might work and he's like yeah yeah and and 
they had a, a 1202FX, a Zenith 1202FX Behringer mixer. If you, you know, YouTube, uh, you know, mixing boards and podcasts, that one pops up most of the time. And so I recognized it and I, I knew exactly what I was looking at. And I said, well, you know, how much are you asking for this mixer? And he's like, well, you know, we're asking uh, $95 for it. But uh, I'm like, well, can I plug it in? Can I make sure it works? And he's like, well, I don't have a power cord for it. I'm like, oh, well, can you guarantee that it works? And every, you know, every knob, everything works. He's like, oh yeah, everything should work. We, you know, we test it all out before we, you know, you know, get it into the pawn shop, obviously. I'm like, well, if you don't have a power cord, I mean, that's going to cost me some money. And he's like, well, you know, yeah, you're right. He's like, you know, make me an offer. So I start thinking about it. I was like, well, I'll tell you what, you got three microphones right here. They're all kind of used and a little banged up. And uh, you got this mixer here that I have no way of knowing if it works. But, uh, you know, if I order a cord on Amazon for it, power cord for it, it's going to set me back like 20 bucks. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you 50 bucks for everything. And he goes, well, how are you paying? I'm like, well, cash, of course. And, you know, I was doing the math and it was like, you know, $180 worth of stuff if I paid, you know, the, the sticker price. And he goes, well, make it $55 so that I feel better about myself. And I'm going to do my best to find you some, some microphone cords. I said, well, okay. You know, it's, it's a little bit of a gamble to, to pick up, especially use electronics. But, but, uh, I said, yeah, fine. So I got a one XLR cord, uh, three microphones and this uh, Behringer mixer for $55. Walk out the door. I'm all excited. Families look at me like, well, God, what did you buy? How much did you spend? I'm like, oh, you know, like, well, it's kind of risky. You know, you don't know if it works. Well, lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, I ordered the, uh, the cable that I needed, the power cable on Amazon, cleaned up the microphones really well. Um, and everything works. Uh, did a little bit of an Amazon search for all the specific model numbers on everything. Uh, and let's just say I made out, like, <laughs> I made out like a banshee with this one, because it, if I bought everything new, it would have been over $300 worth of stuff. So you never know what's out there. You, you, you find a good deal. You go out, you know, thrift shopping or, or, you know, pawn shopping, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, every once in a while you come across a good deal, but I'm not the only one, uh, was thumbing through this magazine again, AOPA. This one's from. Uh, July 2018, there's an article in there written by Julie Summers Walker called Joe and the Amazing Box. When I read this, I thought, wow, this this guy, you know, made out like he makes anyone else who's looking for thrift shop finds look like chump change. <laughs> he made out great. So let me just read this article to you real quick. So an estate sale find now is insured for five million dollars. Several months after earning his private pilot certificate, Joe Porras was digging around in a garage of an estate sale in Midland Park, New Jersey, seeing the name Wright Aeronautical stenciled on a dusty old chest filled with paint cans. He asked the owner if she knew anything about the box. She replied that her husband, long deceased, had brought it home from work when the plant closed. The Curtis Wright Manufacturing Facility in Patterson, New Jersey, which ceased operations in 1948. Enamored with all things aviation after earning his pilot certificate at age 34, Porus offered to buy the box. He paid $5 for it and took it home. He cleaned it up and used it to store his aircraft and flight training manuals. Nearly 30 years later, Porus was touring the Daytona Aviation Heritage National Historic Park in Dayton, Ohio, when he saw a display featuring a box that looked just like his. He described it to the museum employee. The box, the museum guide said, would be priceless. Porus was not quite sure what to do. He contacted the Smithsonian Institute, the Dayton Museum, and others to have the box authenticated. All agreed it was probably authentic. Then, the British television program History Hunters, a show that had been cancelled but was attempting a revival, contacted Porus. 
the show producers came to interview Porus, put a $5 million insurance policy on the crate while they took it off-site to authenticate it, and plan to have the box be the first story in the produced pilot program. The film crew took the box to the Glenn Curtis Museum in nearby Hamdensport, New York. There, Chief Curator Rick Reisingling told them some startling news. This was a rare, purpose-built crate that was probably made between 1916 and 1929 and used as toolkit or to store documentation by Wilbur and Orville Wright. In fact, Reisingling showed Porus a photograph of Oral Wright and Amelia Earhart standing next to the crate similar to his, maybe even the very one they were examining. The film crew interviewed Porus in his Oakland, New Jersey home and discussed the authenticity with Reisling, who told him that he had never seen a complete box from an aviation company from this period and he did not believe It was an ordinary shipping container. This is as rare as it gets, said Porus. They've been filming here since 7 a.m. I've had a crew of 15 people here, including some network brass. Also had an anthropologist, aviation historian, and a professor from Penn State. That was in late October. The show has not been scheduled, and Porus still has the box. Sotheby's of New York had offered to sell it, but he waited 30 years, so Porus will wait a little longer and see if the story restarts a TV show. My goal, he says, is really not in the sale. I'm hoping to have it displayed at the Air and Space Museum in Washington. Right now, this is the thought to be the only one in existence, so I think it should be seen and not locked away in some private collection. So that's my goal. What an amazing story, again, by Julie Summers Walker in the AOPA Pilot Magazine from July of 2018. I read this, and you know, there's a picture of him on the front here in front of this box. It looks like a wood crate. It's nothing special. It's clearly you know, weathered and right there on the front, right Aeronautical Corp. Patterson, New Jersey, USA. And to have a little piece of history like that, to appreciate it, and the fact that he doesn't just want to like sell it and take the cash, that he wants to, he wants it to be in a museum. He wants people to see it. You know, cheers to him, you know, uh, to, to Joe. Good job. This is a piece of history, definitely worth preserving. So as I mentioned earlier in the show, I didn't really get out much on my overnight Lahui. Um, just was feeling kind of lazy, and that's okay. I mean, you can't always bask in the sun and and have your your toes in the sand on every single overnight. Sometimes you just gotta hang out, and and that's exactly what I did. So hanging out in the room, I got to watch a movie quietly without any interruptions, and <laughs> as a you know, a middle-aged guy with a family at home, it's, it's, sometimes it's nice to do that. So I got to watch the movie The Aeronauts. It is uh, all over the internet. There's ads everywhere on social media. Uh, and it was it was a pretty pretty good movie. I enjoyed it. Uh, Reddy Redmayne and Felicity Jones star in it. It is a fictional story, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as, a, <laughs> as someone who has a degree in film production... Um, you know, a lot of people really get hung up on, well, you know, that's not really how it happened. You know, that's, it's just, that movie is not accurate. Well, film, unless it's a documentary, and even then, it's always a perspective um, of history or whatever it's being uh, explained and explored in a documentary. But these are not documentaries. These are film. These are movies. You know, and Hollywood has really jumped on the bandwagon here over the last few years in an effort to tell these untold stories about the underdog or these fantastic events that have happened uh, in the human existence. And 
yeah, there it's entertainment and it's up for, you know, entertainment value. To, it's there to make money. So they're going to change the story in order to maintain a good audience, uh, maintain a moving story. So yeah, The Argonauts is a great film based on real people and fictitious people. Um, and so I found quite a few articles on reviews. It didn't really get super high marks. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes wasn't too happy with it. I think it was like something like 70%. But um, I have been listening to Siskel and Ebert <laughs> since I was a kid. Uh, their movie reviews really kind of paved the way for my you know, adventure in in college and in the university level to get into a degree in film production. Um, so that's what I'm choosing to uh, read to you uh, about movie reviews from the RogerEbert.com website. Uh, this article was written December 6, 2019 by Monica Castillo. And she writes that Tom Harper's The Aeronauts begins just as Amelia, played by Felicity Jones, a balloon pilot, and James, played by Eddie Redgrave, or Redmayne, I keep messing that up, apologize, um, a scientist desperate to prove his theories about the weather. It takes off on their 19th century vertical adventure in front of a large crowd to much fanfare. In flashbacks, the aeronauts explains more about their tenuous relationship between pilot and scientist, how she lost her husband in a ballooning accident, and how James has been laughed at by his colleagues for his outlandish ideas. Eventually, James decides to prove his findings and hires a still grieving Amelia to lead the journey. A generous offer she's hesitant to accept. Back in the present, the ascent of their balloon, Amelia and James face many more dangers and setbacks as they shatter the height record and put their lives at risk for science. She continues to write, Although it's stuffed with many cliches, the aeronauts can feel like a rather enjoyable bit of historical fantasy. Redmayne's character is based on James Glacier, a real British scientist who did break the height record in his day. But his partner on this expedition, Henry Coxwell, has been replaced in the film with Jones's character, who herself is an amalgamation of several balloonists, including Coxwell, for his heroics during the expedition with Glacier, and Sophie Blankhart, one of the few women in the field of aeronautics, and someone who continued to balloon after her husband's death in an accident. Harper, who co-wrote the script with Jack Thorne, introduces Amelia and James as a kind of men-are-from-Mars, women-are-from-Venus pair of polar opposites. Amelia has an adventurous, outgoing spirit with a sense of understanding of playing to the crowd and entertaining others, while James is more of a solemn soul who wants so desperately to be taken seriously as a scientist. He almost doesn't see Amelia's anguish as she deliberates going up in the balloon after her husband's fall or the dangers he might put them in because he wants to push beyond the balloon's limits. Although Amelia is clearly a strong female character, the writers thankfully don't saddle her with the weight needed to represent all women. She's an aeronaut because she wants to be one, not because it's the right thing to do. They're almost cartoonish in their differences, which thankfully doesn't last too long, as they're the only characters we're stuck with for the majority of the film. Jones and Redmayne's strike up a flirty rapport that makes the movie even more interesting, as the stakes and the balloon grow higher. Yeah, nice cliche. Uh, <laughs> might she find love after loss? Will he find the results he's looking for? It will be, <laughs> it will all be for naught if their balloon crashes. The thrill of the aeronauts lies in its death-defying stunts. The actors may be safe, but the movie makes us forget that with the use of cinematographer George Steele's clever camera angles and tension-filled shots. 
and Mark Eckersley's quick editing. There's a lot of CGI in this film, all in an effort of putting on a good show. Beyond the unglamorous but realistic mess inside the basket of the hot air balloon lies CGI landscapes of 19th century England, which the digital camera seems to soak in as if it were another viewer along for the ride. There are also these grand majestic shots of our heroes up in the air hundreds and thousands of feet above the earth that work as both artful breaks from their cramped space where their characters are and terrifying reminders that this whole thing can go wrong at any minute. These shots are composed so convincingly that there were many sharp gasps in my audience, she writes. That response intensified the higher the balloon climbed, the lower the oxygen became, and the colder it got for our heroes. So I'm not going to read on. Uh, there's only another paragraph left, but you know, a couple cliches in there about the the explanation of the film. But uh, all in all, it was a good film. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, I would see it either on the big screen, but not if you have a fear of heights uh, or you get vertigo because even though I was watching it on a little tablet in my hotel room that some of the scenes were absolutely amazing um, they really did a good job in having the viewer forget that they're watching a movie all in all for you know a fictitious film based on a real life event with characters that are both based on real people and you know made up people um it, it was a good film I, I enjoyed it uh i'd probably see it again uh probably on a bigger screen at home i have a, a nice tv i might i might actually sit down and watch it with my daughter or something um but it, it yeah it was a good film and i started digging into it a little bit because i didn't know this story before and i thought well how much of this is you know bs uh fictitious, you know, just movie magic, uh, trying to get this, the story moving along for the for the viewer and how much of it is real. And amazingly, there's quite a bit of information about James Glazier. Uh, looking at Wikipedia, uh, which, as we all know, is not uh, 100% accurate, but uh, particularly in regards to him, I, th I think it's safe to say that most of the information here is right on. Uh, so, found out he was born in Rothery, a Rother, Rotherhithy, uh place in England, I guess, uh, son of a London watchmaker. Glazier was a junior assistant at Cambridge Observatory from 1833 to 1835 before moving to the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, where he served as superintendent of the Department of Meteorology and Magnetism at Greenwich for. 34 years. Uh, the Wikipedia information goes on that says that he actually, in 1845, published dew point tables for the measurement of humidity. As aviators, we use this temperature dew point information all the time to figure out, you know, what it's like. Are we going to have good visibility? Uh, do we need anti-icing on? You know, is there a possibility for frost formation on an aircraft? So he's actually pretty monumental to the development of meteorology and how it relates to aviation. Uh, the Wikipedia page goes on to say that he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in June of 1849. Uh, he was a founding member of the Meteorological Society in 1850 and the Aeronautical Society of Great Britain in 1866. So it has all his accolades and all the acknowledgement. Um, he did marry in 1843 a woman named Cecilia Louisa Belleville, a daughter of Henry Belleville, the assistant at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. So uh, he he met the assistant's daughter and they hit it off, got married. They had two sons, uh, Ernest Glacier uh, and the mathematician James Whitbread Lee Glacier, who lived from 1848 to 1928. Uh, and he had one daughter, Cecilia Apollina. That's a beautiful name. Uh, died in 1932. So there is uh, a lunar crater named after him. The name was approved by the IAU. 
the International Astronomical Union. Um, and that was in 1935. In the pop culture section of Wikipedia, it does explain that The Aeronauts, released in 2019, includes a fictionalized account of the 5th of September 1862 flight. The film depicts a fictional pilot Amelia Wren, a composite of real-life female balloonist, uh, joining Glacier in an epic for survival while attempting to make discoveries in a gas balloon. The movie omits Henry Coxwell entirely. Uh, a report in the Daily Telegraph quotes Keith Moore, head of the library at the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, that's a handful or a mouthful, uh, as saying that it's a great shame that Henry isn't portrayed in the film because he uh, performed very well and saved the life of the leading scientist. So the film changed who the additional character was. The pilot of the balloon in the actual ascent was not a woman at all. It was a man by the name of Coxwell, Henry Coxwell. So I, of course, Wikipedia, Henry Tracy Coxwell. And I found that he was the youngest son of the commander Joseph Coxwell of the Royal Navy and grandson of Reverend Charles Coxwell of Abling, how do you say that? Al. Blington, Alblington House, uh, in Gloucestershire. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Gloucestershire, a county in southwest England, uh, and was born at the uh, parsonage at Woolham on the 2nd of March of 1819. He went to school in Chatham, where his family moved in 1822. He goes on, uh, you know, telling about how when he was a boy he had an interest in balloons. Uh, he spared no efforts to witness as many ascents as possible, and uh, among the aeronauts he admired and envied. As a boy were people like Mrs. Graham, Charles Green, Robert Cocking, and the parachutist John Hampton. So this guy was, was a pilot, uh, a balloon pilot an aeronaut, as they call it. Uh, he became a professional balloonist in 1848 uh, when he was entrusted with the management of the balloon, the Sliff. In 1862, the British Association for Advancement of Science determined to make investigations on the upper atmosphere using balloons. Dr. James Glazier, FRS, was chosen to carry out the experiments. And at the suggestion of Charles Green, Coxwell was employed to fly the balloons. Coxwell constructed a 93,000 cubic foot capacity balloon named the Mammoth. And on the 5th of September, 1862, taking off from Wolverhampton, Coxwell and Glazier reached the greatest height achieved to date. Glazier had lost consciousness during the ascent. His last barometric reading indicated an altitude of 29,000 feet, and Mr. Coxwell lost all sensation in its hands, but managed just in time to pull the valve cord with his teeth before losing consciousness. The balloon dropped 19,000 feet in 15 minutes, landing safely near Ludwo, or Ludlow. Uh, later, calculations estimated their maximum altitude was 35 to 37,000 feet. Um, if you stop and think about that, as a jet pilot, <laughs> you know, 37,000 feet, outside air temperatures, you know, minus 20 to minus 50 uh, Fahrenheit, it, it, lack of oxygen, time of use, useful consciousness under three minutes, uh, and in some cases you know, under 10 seconds. Uh, it, just an amazing feat. Uh, and I had no idea that a manned gas balloon ever had made it up that high. So this movie really sparked a lot of interest in the balloon adventure and, and the history of what people were willing to do in the name of science. A wonderful story, great film, uh, you know, the, not the best Hollywood storyline, uh, but 
it really taught me a thing or two, and it got me out there to do a little bit of research on my own. And in doing some of the research for this episode, I started digging around the internet, looking for things to back up a lot of what we're talking about here. And one of the th- one of the websites I found was actually quite funny. I'm going to put the link in the show notes below. So whatever you're using to listen, either scroll up or scroll left or whatever you have to do to get to the show notes where it explains uh, what I'm talking about here every week on, a, on each episode. Uh, and in there, you will find uh, links that I encourage you to check out uh, at the end of the, at the end of the episode, of course, which is right around the corner. Uh, But one of them is, should I be a commercial pilot, a one minute quiz? Uh, So you take the quiz and it's a fun little game. It's nothing serious, but it'll, it'll tell you if you should or should not be a pilot. Uh, There's another one there. I'll put another link in the show notes. Uh, Do you have what it takes to become a pilot? Start the quiz, you know, and (laughs) a little cartoon in there of a uh, a captain watching a looks like a 747 takeoff. Um, and I took the quiz and, you know, I, I did get all the answers correct and a little, little unfair that I, uh, I, you know, I do this for a profession, but it was pretty fun. It was a cute little quiz. Um, so as I, here I am looking for like quizzes and fun things to do on the internet in relation to some of the things I talked about today. I also came across an article that I found interesting that I want to mention. I'll put a link in the show notes, uh, but this article was from Balance Careers, uh, written by Serena Houston. This article was updated in November 20th of 2019, so it's relatively recent. And it is entitled, Seven Wrong Reasons for Wanting to Become an Airline Pilot. And of course, uh, if you want to be an airline pilot because of any of these reasons, wrong answer. <laughs> this is not, not a career for you. So, you know, the number one, of course, is if you're doing it for the money, you're you're making a mistake because though the money can be good towards the tail end of the career, it's going to suck royally. Not so much anymore, especially with after what we were talking about with pilot shortages and whatnot, but definitely the cost of getting into this career is high. If you're doing it uh, for the fame, uh, no, uh, back in the day, maybe, uh, during the golden ages of aviation, but definitely nothing, uh, no fame here, uh, for the awards and the accolades, uh, you'll be very disappointed if you choose this career for that, uh, for the travel perks, you know, a lot of pilots at the beginning of their career. Yeah. Okay. They'll, they'll go and they'll travel maybe a couple times a year, but uh, the last thing you want to do is be in an airport on your day off or in an airplane. Um, you know, I, I try to do at least one vacation trip with the family a year, but it's not like I'm jet setting all over the, the world or anything. Um, and if you're doing it for the awesome schedule, the luxurious hotel rooms, for the relaxed work environment, all these reasons are the wrong <laughs> reasons to be an airplane pilot. I just gave you titles there. So if you want to read more about the story, click on the link in the show notes. Well, that about does it for the show for this week. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, would love to hear the feedback. Uh, again, you can do that by visiting the website at www.aviatortony.com. That's Alpha Victor, the number eight. Romeo Tango, Oscar November Yankee.com. From there, you can listen to the show via the Listen Here link under the episode tabs. Um, you can also favorite Squawk Ident um, by putting it as an app on your phone. Uh, it's called Appifying. Uh, if you have an Apple phone, all you have to do is go to the uh, aviator tony website and click on the the box on the i believe it's on the upper right hand corner with the arrow sticking out of it and save it to your home page or your home screen uh android users uh, you might have to give me a heads up on how to do that but i'm sure there's a way to save a bookmark on your home page or on your home screen and that way you don't have to you know go through your web browser and whatnot what i'm excited about is the new links in the show notes starting now on this episode that will directly take you to leave a feedback, uh, an audio feedback 
or you can send me messages uh, just by talking into your phone and it'll send it right to me. Um, there's also going to be a link uh, there for the social medias, the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter pages and all that stuff. And if you're not already following us, I encourage you to, to take a look because I do occasionally post photos from the line and you can kind of see where Aviator Tony is at. So in closing, I just would like to say thank you so much for all of the support and all the listens out there. I encourage you to subscribe, like, and share the episode with anyone who you might think would be interested. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this grateful aviator. Keep the dirty side down, be safe, and take care of each other.